Even Jan worden, het is 12 uur. Ga je gang. Je microfoon is uit, even Jan. Even Jan, je microfoon staat niet aan. Oké. Okay. You will be listening to the 16th lunch webinar of the Royal Netherlands Society of Engineers, Department Electrical Engineering. Today we will go into the control room of the future at TU Delft for the electricity grid in the Netherlands. My name is Evert-Jan Bouvy and I will be your moderator for today. As technical support will be Henk Baart of our team be in charge. First, some house rules. Please switch off your camera and your microphone. If you have any questions to the speaker, please put them forward through the chat facility in Teams. Preferably in English, but in Dutch will be also no problem. We will put the questions at the end of the presentation to the speaker. This session will be recorded and be presented on YouTube. If you watch this webinar, you agree with the recording and publishing. In short, I will tell you some things about our society. We are the leading society of engineers in the Netherlands and are existing for 175 years already. Today, we are happy to have 131 spectators, 59 being members of our society, 44 working in public office, 40 at companies, 41 in the energy sector, and regrettably, only two being students. This is the 16th lunch webinar we are organizing as Department of Electrical Engineering, and we are very pleased with this number of spectators. We refer to the website kivi.nl for further information, also on how to become a member of our society. A classic electricity grid used to have conventional power plants at one side, the consumers of electricity at the other, and the power grid in between. Nowadays, you will have more and more weather dependent wind and solar energy, and at the consumer part of the grid, also more generation from solar and wind energy will appear. This requires a totally different approach of the control of the grids. In the control room of the future, the emphasis of these changes will be studied real time through simulation, especially what could happen after a cyber attack. I should like to give the stage to Assistant Professor Dr. Alex Stefanov for his presentation. He is among others, the technical director of this control room. Alex, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much, Jan. And, uh... Hello, everybody. Um, I will share my screen in a moment. OK, so uh, welcome. And uh, in this webinar, we will discuss about the control room of the future for a resilient and cyber secure power grid. Uh, my name is Alex Stefanov. I'm assistant professor in intelligent electrical power grids at TU Delft in the Netherlands, and uh, I conduct research on cybersecurity of power grids at all trans uh, system levels, transmission, distribution, and grid edge. And in a broader sense, I work on resilience of cyber physical systems. That means the physical power system, which on top we add the communication uh, layers, the information and communication technologies. So together they form a cyber physical system. I'm the director of the Control Room of the Future Technology Center, and uh, my research team uh, that I lead is called Cyber Resilient Power Grids. Before I joined uh, TU Delft, I worked as a senior engineer at Novo Grid uh, in Dublin, Ireland, and uh, professional engineer as professional engineer at ESB Networks, uh, the Irish distribution system operator. And I'm also a charter engineer registered with the uh, Institution of Engineers of Ireland. 
So let's dive into the contents. First of all, why do we need the control room of the future? This will be the first question we would like to answer. Well, it, the answer comes, uh, I think we can find it uh, in by looking at the energy transition. This is uh, mainly led by decarbonization, decentralization and digitalization. And uh, it's safe to say that they, they all change the way we operate the power grid, both transmission and distribution systems. Now, in this image, uh, you see uh, a simplified version of the smart grid. You, we have, let's say, from the top here, we have the conventional generation that uh, we haven't uh, replaced all of them yet. So this uh, will say, let's say, it's a, a hydropower plant, and this would be uh, perhaps um, a, a thermal power plant, and we have transmission lines. Uh, we have um, renewables as well. Uh, we integrate uh, uh, wind farms onshore and offshore. We have uh, PV farms and uh, battery storage and so on. Um, here around the middle, uh, we would have the transmission to distribution system integration and um, uh, we will, uh, both transmission and distribution system operators uh, use national control centers to monitor and control remotely their area uh, of, of the power grid. Uh, so uh, transmission system operators uh, would have uh, a, a control center and all distribution system operators will have their own control centers to monitor their distribution systems. And then in the energy transition, we have a lot of action at the edge of the grid in our smart cities. So what you, we see here, we the, the tend to decarbonize and decentralize uh, the, the power grids uh, is uh, basically translated in embedded generation. So we, we add, um, uh, let's say, small scale uh, wind farms and uh, photovoltaic uh, PV panels uh, in the connected to the medium voltage. But then, of course, we also have PV on the rooftop of the houses. So here we are looking at smart homes uh, where we have heat pumps. And uh, uh, in order to decarbonize uh, our society, we move to electric transportation, uh, electric uh, cars, so uh, EV charging plays an important role. And uh, digitalization at the edge of the grid is bringing all these things together. So here we have, uh, let's say, 5G or 4G, um, machine to machine communication that enables us to uh, monitor how much the electricity production on the rooftop with an app, but also aggregators of EV charging and uh, uh, PVs uh, to offer flexibility uh, services to grid operators. Now, as we digitalize the power grid, of course, uh, we also uh, uh, deploy communications at, at all levels uh, in the grid. And um, uh, this uh, impacts the transmission, distribution and the edge of the grid. And they change the way we operate the power grid, as I mentioned before, how the power system operation will look like uh, in, uh, in the near future, let's say 10, 15 years from now. Uh, it will be interesting to see. Uh, Will we still need a control room? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, if we want to uh, go towards uh, complete decentralization, then we don't need the centralized approach anymore. And maybe we will uh, rely on self-organizing power grids and microgrids. Or maybe we will uh, still use a control room. And maybe in this uh, scenario, we will deploy more artificial intelligence. So machine learning, for example, to support system operation, operators uh, uh, in their decision making. Now, I don't envision that uh, uh, robots will be sitting on chairs. This is just to uh, exemplify that we, we will have system operators, but perhaps system operators, instead of having a, a full human in the loop uh, interaction with the power grid, perhaps they will play more like um, a supervisory role, just like in the airplane where the pilot takes uh, control of the takeoff and landing and uh, during the predictable parts of the flight, the aircraft is in autopilot mode. So the system, uh, so the pilots are, syst uh, are supervisors and similarly system operators could play a role. But how do we get there? We can't go there in this direction in one big leap. We need a lot of research and also baby steps because uh, power system, uh, power systems, we are kind of conservative, so we don't uh, change as fast as uh, digital uh, industry or um, 
uh, other, let's say, aviation or military. So we need to conduct research and, um, and, and craft the future together. So for this reason, we developed uh, a technology center at UDELFT called Control Room of the Future. And here, uh, the vision is that the future power grid is intelligent, resilient, and cyber secure. And this research facility is um, used for, res for research development and demonstration of future power grid technologies. So it becomes um, a unique future ready and multi domain experimental setup. And what is important to note, this is, a note, is, is meant as a neutral ground for transmission and distribution system operators and vendors, where we, uh, where we can use it as a hub for future power grid technologies. To give you a flavor of uh, possible research, so we look at um, intelligent um, uh, power system operations and uh, uh, reliability uh, and operational resilience. So here, in, in, under intelligent power system operations, we can look at future control of power systems, cybersecurity, digital twins, and uh, how artificial intelligence can support decision making of system operators. The research technology looks, uh, uh, the technology center, so the control room looks something like this. So this is, in, uh, it, it exists, it's a real picture. And uh, uh, we, it unlocks uh, opportunity for us to use human in the loop. So um, we use here industrial grade uh, software and hardware for uh, energy management systems, for supervisory control and data acquisition, so SCADA systems. We partner with um, uh, utilities, with transmission and distribution system operators, and with vendors. And uh, we have the capability of um, uh, uh, simulating the digital twin of the power grid, um, envision different, uh, let's say, uh, uh, scenarios of various levels of uh, uh, renewable energy penetration. And uh, we can stress the system, we can conduct cyber attacks, we can cause uh, let's say communication disturbances and uh, test the reaction of uh, system operators in a safe environment where nothing can go wrong. We can collapse the uh, cyber physical system, um, so the power grid. We can cause a blackout in our simulated environment, and then we can restart and try again with a different scenario. So nothing can go wrong because this is not connected to any in the real industrial control system. Between the control room uh, of the future and the back end, uh, we have communication uh, layers, so emulated communication networks in our data center. And what you see in, the, in this picture is uh, the back end. We have a digital substation connected to a real time uh, digital simulator, RTDS. So RTDS is a supercomputer that is dedicated to uh, model the power grid and run the power grid in real time. So then when we connect Harder in the loop devices, they will not see any difference if they are connected to a simulated environment running on RTDS or if they are connected uh, to a uh, digital substation. Um, so this is the infrastructure on uh, to, to uh, clarify, we simulate the power grid, the physical power system on the real time digital simulator. This has uh, is how we do this. We uh, we model the power grid using differential algebraic equations, um, and uh, we we use electromagnetic transients, so EMT models, and uh, the granularity or the resolution of this machine it, it goes to the microsecond level. So it can um, it can generate uh, simulation results every two microseconds. So this is all in real time. It's also um, time synchronized. And then we can connect uh, the digital substations or relays uh, that will be deployed uh, in uh, uh, for real power grids to um, uh, to monitor uh, to to protect the infrastructure from short circuits, for example. Um, the communication networks enable remote supervision and control from the control room. So then we can have actually we replicate representative uh, parts of um, uh, the power grid infrastructure. Uh, in a safe environment. Now, in terms of uh, the scope and research, well, in a, let's say if I would summarize it in a sentence, our uh, scope will be to develop cyber secure functionalities for operators of the future. So would, what would that mean? Well, we have uh, to uh, develop uh, on, on different research um, uh, lines where we can develop digital twins for online situational awareness and decision support. We can 
uh, look, investigate heap revision and human machine interfaces and advanced <coughs> coordination. We can look at uh, intraday and day ahead forecasting, flexibility and congestion management, cybersecurity and resilience of the power grids. Uh, this is highlighted because later on, uh, we, I will refer this as a, uh, an example of research that we do. We can also look at artificial intelligence based automated detection, prevention, and mitigation of cyber attacks, uh, next generation uh, grid operation for transmission system operators, distribution system operators, and grid edge, and uh, how we can use AI for system operation at all levels, so low voltage, uh, high, medium voltage, high voltage, and extra high voltage uh, networks. And ultimately, we would like to develop autopilots for power system operation of the future and uh, see if self-organizing and self-healing uh, intelligent power grids is the future. Maybe or maybe not. We will see. But as we go in our research journey, we will uh, test new functionalities and, uh, and provide training for power system operators uh, to, um, to, to use them. Now, to summarize the objectives of the control room uh, of the Future Technology Center, well, uh, first we conduct research, development, demonstration of future substation and uh, control center applications for both trans uh, distribution and transmission system operators. We test and analyze in real time cyber secure functionalities using uh, Power Grid Digital Twins. And uh, we train uh, system operators in a flexible and isolated uh, experimental environment. So think of the Boeing flight simulator. Uh, it will be similar. We would like to uh, deploy the latest technologies and the one, the, the technology that, such as machine learning and the technology we develop in our research and try to test it out and running out by uh, system operators and see what would be the impact. Get their feedback and uh, of course, uh, uh, continue innovate. Um, with our vendors, we we give them an opportunity for them to show thought leadership and also um, uh, display, uh, just as in the showroom, the future energy management systems that uh, we co-innovate and uh, uh, demonstrate how we can change the power system operation. Now, in terms of impact, um, the control room uh, of the future uh, is is envisioned to make in, uh, to, to to make an impact and transfer technology to utilities, but through vendors. We partner with them. We conduct uh, research, development, demonstration, or, uh, and uh, set proof of concept and develop open source software prototypes. And in this uh, uh, environment, we uh, we can achieve a technology readiness level. Uh, of seven, let's say demonstration in operational environment, or even eight system complete and qualified. So we can conduct research from TRL three and four up, and uh, we can uh, de uh, develop the prototypes, demonstrate them in an operational environment. And with our vendors, we can uh, 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 increase the TRL level to, uh, to eight, and then it's up to them to take it to uh, even further, like TRL nine. Uh, in a nutshell, this is a um, um, overview of the technology center, so the vision and our objectives. And here I have a video uh, of uh, Professor Peter Palinski. He's uh, also um, uh, uh, a director of the control room of the future together with me. And uh, he will explain in one minute video uh, and give a flavor about uh, the topic of uh, resiliency and uh, uh, cyber resilience that I will address in the next slides. So let's see if the video works. In this control room, we are developing the next generation of software for operators and for controls in the power system to make it more resilient. We work with our students here to develop new types of analytics, of controls and of uh, procedures to keep uh, the lights on. We cannot prevent incidents. They happen. Um, it might be a natural disaster, it might be a cyber attack. Of course, it's important to protect and prevent, but uh, that's only the first line of defense. We have to be prepared. We have to know how to identify such incidents, how to isolate them, and how to recover quickly. So this is called resiliency, and this involves software, hardware, and also people. 
we can create disasters in our simulation and see which structures, which pieces of software, which hardware, and which human decisions do we need uh, to ride through that uh, with the smallest impact possible. Okay, that was the first, uh, the short video. So I hope uh, it gives a flavor of uh, 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 of resiliency topic. And uh, this is uh, what I will talk about next. So from all those research topics, I chose one, one that is uh, very popular now and uh, uh, a hot topic as well, and that uh, which is cybersecurity and resilience of power grids. Now, I mentioned that uh, the energy transition is driven by decarbonization, decentralization and digitalization. Um, and here I will refer mainly to how digitalization changes uh, uh, the, the power system operation. Well, first of all, I would like to say that we should embrace digitalization. We should not be afraid of it, even if digitalization introduces new cybersecurity threats in smart grids. Now, as you see here on this image, we have um, uh, the IoT in the middle. So this means that all the grid edge devices it, uh, currently and in the, as in the future, uh, they will be all uh, connected and aggregators and distribution system operators will be able uh, to leverage uh, electric vehicles uh, uh, and PV on the rooftop of the houses or so smart inverters, um, the, the, the smart metering to offer flexibility. But they also mean that they, uh, uh, let's say, introduce a larger attack surface. So what would be the impact, for example, if uh, thousands of electric cars would be uh, hacked at the same time and disconnected uh, overnight when they are all charging, what would be the impact on the distribution system operation? At the same time, we integrate uh, renewables and uh, we uh, deploy uh, uh, digital, uh, digital technologies, so information and communication technologies uh, in our digital substations. And I, you will see uh, in a later slide uh, what uh, digital substation is. What's the difference between digital substation and the traditional uh, substation? And what are the vulnerabilities and threats that we introduce with information and communication technologies? So all these um, uh, ICTs, um, they provide um, uh, great advantages in terms of uh, more uh, communicating more data faster, uh, higher granularity, but at the same time, uh, we it is more and more challenging to keep the private communication networks of utilities completely separate from the public communication networks. And even so, the first scenario that I mentioned, even if we would completely isolate the private communication networks of utilities from the public ones, which is uh, very difficult to do, um, the first scenario where an attacker would disconnect uh, uh, large volumes of electric vehicles, that would be, have an impact on distribution system operation, which in turn can have an impact on transmission system operation uh, that may cause cascading failures. So let's look a little bit at the motivation and background for cybersecurity. The main uh, <clears throat> thing is that the power grid resilience to cyber attacks is unknown, and one of our main research questions uh, would be a very broad and general question. Can cyber attacks cause cascading failures leading to a European blackout? Now, on this image to the left here, we have um, a major recent blackouts and outages. So they are historic uh, disturbances uh, over the years so from 2002 to 2020. And here you have uh, the affected uh, uh, people, so millions of people. And you see how uh, we had in 2003 uh, a blackout in United States and Canada. Also, we had one in Europe, Italy, um, and so on. So we had one in India, and uh, lately we had more uh, outages and blackouts. And as you see, there are two power outages, not a blackout, but outages in Ukraine, 2015 and 2016. And they are the only power outages that were reported to be caused by cyber attacks. If there are more, that are not reported, of course, we don't know, but uh, these are the main, the, 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 the only um, uh, or the first two power outages uh, reported and documented uh, in the literature that were caused by cyber attacks. On this um, uh, axis here or on this uh, diagram, we see uh, cyber attacks uh, on industrial control systems from starting from Stuxnet in 2010 
and then going to towards 2015 2016 attacks in ukraine so black energy tree and industrial malware was used to cause power outages and then we go towards um the ransomware with uh, um and other uh, cyber security cyber attacks on industrial control systems you may have heard of WannaCry, uh, solar winds the colonial pipeline and so on so it's an emerging topic and it can affect uh, industrial control systems. And here we have, um, let's say a slide that we are asking ourselves, are cyber attacks a real threat on, especially on power grids? Well, for, let's look at uh, the incident in uh, that happened in uh, December 17, on December 17, 2016. There was a cyber attack on the power grid in Ukraine and um, uh, the attack uh, targeted the supervisory control and data acquisition, so the SCADA system, at transmission level. Uh, the attackers targeted a single 330 kV substation, so a big substation, but the power outage, so the impact of the attack was felt um, uh, in the distribution system, where 200 megawatt of load was not supplied. This was a more sophisticated attack than 2015, and here we have a comparison. Just a very brief comparison. There's no point of going in too many details. Um, but on on uh, on uh, if you Google the two incidents, you will find the detailed reports. So in 2015 uh, and 2016, they both uh, the cyber attacks uh, started with phishing emails where uh, uh, engineers uh, or employees of the distribution system operators uh, were uh, tricked into clicking a link and um, uh, installing a malware uh, in their IT systems. Then uh, uh, IT uh, means information technology, OT means operational technology. So OT will be the uh, communication networks that are used for real-time monitoring and control of the critical infrastructure of the power grid in our case. So the operational technology system was accessed via the IT systems in both. Now, the difference is uh, between them is that in 2015, attackers took remote control of the supervisory control and data acquisition of the SCADA system, and they opened circuit breakers causing power outages. And in 2016, the attackers used malware to automate the cyber attack and automatically uh, open circuit breakers to cause power outages. So this leads to, again, to a question that we don't need to answer today, but uh, it's, it's a broad question. Can cyber attacks cause European blackout in, in, in our case? But how about uh, to, uh, extra, uh, to generalize even further? Can they cause uh, continental blackouts in interconnected power grids? Also, maybe United States or other continents, not only Europe. Well, to give you a flavor uh, of why this may be possible well we can look at uh, a real incident in 2021 that happened in continental europe uh, in in europe so in, in uh, interconnected power grids of europe here you see the map now uh, there was uh, there were cascading trips of transmission lines uh, that led to uh, the power the interconnected power grids in europe that you see here to split in two areas so one uh, here in the uh, east and one in the west and by splitting the system it means that all the power lines the interconnector were disconnected along this line and uh, the system uh, typically operates at one unique frequency that is 50 hertz and then uh, you have two uh, frequency levels one in each area now this was initiated by a basler cup, uh, coupler trip in croatia and uh, uh, the point of no return, so from the moment uh, the physical disturbance happens until uh, all the lines automatically started tripping uh, across this border. Uh, the point, so this uh, we call this point when they start tripping and the cascade is um, uh, uncontrollable as the point of no return. So from the moment of the initial disturbance until the point of no return was reached, it took around 20 seconds, so it, it's quite fast. Now, imagine that cyber attacks that are uh, distributed could be distributed across Europe uh, would uh, have similar effects. So that was it would be it it can lead to cascading failures and a blackout. Now, in terms of problem statement objectives, well, what we try to uh, to do uh, to to research in the control of the future technology center at UDelft 
uh, we want to see uh, and uh, 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 we want to investigate the operational resilience of power grids to cyber attacks because this is at the moment unle relatively unknown. So one question would be, what would be the impact on power grid stability? Can cyber attacks induce cascading failures and lead to a blackout? And then how do we prove that cyber attacks can cause cascading failures and, and lead to a blackout? How can we show experimental proof uh, for an acceleration of cascading events uh, of cascading failures when we compare with the physical disturbances? Now, in order to have a, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, go a little bit in more depth and um, uh, have a, uh, a better understanding of how we can investigate uh, this, um, uh, their, their impact, and also what can we do to uh, mitigate, I will first like to introduce the digital substation concept and uh, a communication standard that is used for digital substations, which is IEC 62850. Now, in in this picture, top, you see the traditional, um, um, uh, let's say, the uh, conventional substation where you have transmission lines, then, uh, uh, then they would uh, go into a substation where you change voltage levels and uh, connect with, uh, this would be, a, let's say, a, a point of connecting uh, a sub, uh, a transmission lines and uh, uh, the power flow will uh, will flow through different lines. You can here you have the chance by opening circle breakers that you see in, in this image to disconnect the transmission line from the network and change the topology of the power grid and so on. Now for monitoring and control, uh, both local from the substation and remote uh, uh, monitoring and control with a control center, we use information and communication technologies and we call this operational technologies, OTs. Now, what you see in the uh, in, uh, in the ground here, you see a lot of hard wiring uh, connecting uh, 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 the physical uh, power uh, power equipment um, to, uh, let's say, in, uh, intelligent electronic devices that are you know, that their primarily function is to uh, monitor and control the the, the voltage, the currents uh, that flow through this line, active and reactive power, and so on. Now. As we digitalize, we embrace digitalization. We replace all this hard wiring with digital communication. So this would be a fiber optic. It's much cleaner and it provides uh, uh, more data faster. And we use a communi uh, various communication protocols like IEC 104. And in our case, we call this IEC, we use IEC 61850. And uh, they, it, it, this standard has multiple protocols like GOOSE, that stands for Generic Object Oriented Substation Event, Sample Values, that uh, stands for uh, um, yeah, uh, SV, that stands for Sample Values, and MMS, that stands for Manufacturing Message Service, Messaging Service. So to give you uh, a brief flavor of what sample values would do, well, uh, it will just, uh, uh, let's say, uh, do the analog to digital conversion. So the voltages and currents will be reported to intelligent electronic devices as um, in digital format. Um, so we will have communication packets reporting the voltages and currents, the measurements uh, to the control systems. And GUS will, is a protocol that is used to uh, send a set point to a circle breaker to open the circle breaker so that uh, the transmission line in this case can get uh, disconnected. Now, in our infrastructure, what we did, well, we can uh, model a digital substation. So uh, this is a schematic of the digital substation at process level, bay level and station level. So we would have uh, 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 current transformers and voltage transformers to, uh, uh, to report voltage and current waveforms to sense them. Yeah? So then uh, they are the merging units, which are intelligent electronic devices, would do uh, uh, the sampling of uh, analog voltages and currents into sample values. So this would be all digital communications. And then we have various levels at the bay level of protection and control. And then at the station level, we have, um, let's say, a, uh, operating stations with uh, 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 SCADA in the substation, engineering uh, workstations, and gateways to communicate these measurements to the remotely to the control room, um, to the national control centers. Now, protection devices would, let's say, detect short circuits, and then they would, uh, by using sample values, and then they will send uh, goose packets to open circuit breakers. So this is, in a nutshell, how it works. 
and in our uh, environments, um, we use the real-time digital simulators, so the supercomputer to simulate uh, the power grid, a digital twin of the power grid in real time. And then uh, we connect real uh, uh, devices, intelligent electronic devices like the merging units, protection and control, with um, uh, uh, the conventional, let's say, uh, um, hardwiring uh, by using power amplifiers or fully digital by using the 61850 sample values in GUS via a network switch. So we can connect the, 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 the intelligent electronic devices. We could simulate the short circuits um, in the RTDS. The sample values would be communicated to, let's say in this case, ID1. ID1 would uh, detect uh, the, the short circuit by running its algorithm and then would send a GUS packet to open the circuit breaker uh, uh, to uh, that is simulated in RTDS. Of course, in this in environment, we don't have uh, an uh, let's say a, a infrastructure um, a, a, like a power grid infrastructure. So everything is simulated in the real time digital simulator. Now, with this infrastructure, we can uh, do various types of cyber attacks. And one simple cyber attack would be to monitor the uh, communication traffic through this network switch, just like it would happen in the substation, capture goose packets and sample values, and uh, try to manipulate them to make the uh, uh, intelligent electronic devices um, uh, think that there is a, um, uh, let's say, uh, a short circuit or uh, um, let's say, a, um, uh, a problem with the power system operation, so they would trip uh, a circuit breaker, or we just make uh, the actuators think that uh, uh, intelligent electronic devices are instructing them to open. So with this real-time digital simulator, so with this digital twin, we could assess what would be the impact on power system stability, uh, power system operation, and how this can cause cascading failures and a blackout. Now, if we look at uh, what happens in reality, so um, or how uh, what would be the impact of cyber attacks targeting multiple substations? Well, first of all, we can look at uh, what the Federal Energy Regula Regulatory Commission investigation found, uh, and uh, this was uh, implemented here. You can see the source. Uh, they found that 30 uh, critical substations in the United States uh, so they identified 30 critical substations in the United States and a coordinated attacks across nine of them could cause an extended blackout. So this is the, uh, the, the, the summary of their investigation. So we use a test system on a real-time digital simulator. Uh, it is called IEEE 39 bus system. So this power grid does not exist in reality. It, it simply doesn't exist. It is a test system where we can uh, uh, simulate uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, 10 power plants, transmission lines, transformers, and, uh, and loads. Um, it's all dynamic. It has protection uh, uh, models implemented as well. And we conduct a cyber attack uh, that in our lab and analyze the impact on this system. So in this case, the cyber attack uh, is conducted on substation number 14. So it's all uh, uh, fictitious. Substation 14 does not exist in reality. And then uh, uh, the impact of it is that three lines uh, are maliciously disconnected by uh, this cyber attack. Now, what would be the impact on system operation? Well, multiple lines uh, would be tripped due to distance protection. Uh, the reason for this is that distance relay confuses heavy loading coupled with low system voltages and uncleared uh, for an unclear zone tree fault because the imp impedance enters the third zone of protection. And this phenomenon uh, was observed in real world cascading failures and blackouts, like in United States 2003 and in Turkey 2015. So for this reason, uh, multiple lines are disconnected uh, uh, from, uh, the, uh, from the power grid causing uh, this area to island. So uh, we want to avoid islanding. So uh, generators two and three will be isolated. And uh, their uh, rate of change of frequency, the rock of protection, uh, will disconnect these lines, because uh, these uh, generators, to avoid damage to and also for uh, to the turbines, but also to uh, for safety reasons. Line eight, nine trips also on distance protection. So same uh, observed phenomenon. 
and then area one becomes unsupplied. Now, what's uh, in our scenario? It is, we assume it's a distributed cyber attack across the power grid. So uh, nothing stops the attackers to conduct another attack on another substations that would result in two more lines being disconnected. So uh, as a result, distance relay trips uh, line 21, 22, generators six and seven form another island. So it's kind of similar to the previous uh, uh, scenario. More lines are disconnected on distance protection and more generators are disconnected by their interface protection. And as you see, the cascade uh, continues happening. So we are reaching 16 seconds from the for when we started the simulation. Uh, so it's pretty fast. 18 seconds, uh, the whole power grid collapses. So then in this small test system uh, is uh, collapsed in about 18 seconds. Now, preliminary conclusions is that um, cyber attacks on power grids can lead to loss of load, can lead to equipment damage, they can cause volatile, uh, voltage and rotor angle instability, and uh, the simultaneous multiple generators and line can be disconnected. Um, it can lead to cascades of three peak events and a partial or complete blackout. And here we have a list of uh, power system blackouts with uh, how many millions of people were affected. And the first ones, except the last one, they are all caused by uh, physical disturbances, so natural disturbances, human in the, uh, human error or misconfiguration, but they were not related to cyber attacks. Only the last one was uh, the one in 2015 that caused an outage to 225,000 customers. This was caused by a cyber attack. Now, um, let's also look in the four minutes that are left from our webinar. What would be the uh, mitigation techniques? So we uh, we observe the impact. Well, we already have uh, a, a communication standard called IEC 62351, and this aims to provide end-to-end -end cybersecurity measures for power grids. This standard addresses cybersecurity issues for different uh, power system communication standards, including. IEC 61850, and here you'll see uh, a mapping how uh, um, the 62351-6 would uh, protect the, the other uh, standards. Um, but it, of course, it needs to be properly implemented. One way to implement, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, the security controls so that the, the the cyber attack that I uh, the, the the attack scenario that I uh, discussed and we sh we seen the impact but we didn't discuss how it's happening, but uh, uh, we can discuss how we can prevent it. So uh, we can use message authentication codes uh, to check the integrity of uh, the goose and sample values uh, packets or data frames. Now we use um, encryption algorithms, so uh, advanced encryption standard or secure hashing algorithm can be used uh, for, to generate the message authentication codes. This is similar to symmetric encryption, so same private key is used for generation and verification of uh, the message authentication code values. And uh, I will explain how it works in a second, but it's very important to know to to know to and uh, to uh, to note that uh, this solution meets the real time requirements for critical applications. Because if we want to encrypt, of course, we add an overhead. But this solution is actually very um, efficient. So how it works? If we have uh, an intelligent electronic device, and then we have uh, that is used for protection. Then we have an intelligent electronic device that controls the circle breaker to open, and we have a communication network in between, just in our lab setup. The, um, uh, the goose packet, the goose message, will be sent to open the circle breaker. Now we need here we need to check that this message, uh, the integrity of this message, is is um, uh, was not changed. So the packet was not changed uh, by an attacker that would instruct the breaker ID to open when it's not needed. So how it works is that we take uh, the message, uh, the goose uh, message, we use the MAC algorithm so the, uh, to generate the message authentication code. Uh, so we are using, a, uh, we generate a hash value. This is just like a light signature. And then we send the goose packet together with this signature to the breaker ID. The breaker ID will take the goose packet 
so the message itself, will apply the same MAC algorithm and the same key to generate another signature. And then uh, we will compare the signature that was sent uh, by the protection ID with the signature that we computed based on the message we received. If they match, it means that the packet is valid. Nobody changed the, uh, the, the contents of the packet and we can uh, 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 act on it. If they don't match, then of course we will reject uh, this packet. So um, this is in a nutshell uh, uh, the overview of mitigation and cybersecurity. We can add hash-based message authentication codes. We need the key management infrastructure. Uh, which may, uh, uh, let's say, discourage uh, the adoption of the security controls. And we also need to keep in mind the trade-off between protection requirements uh, and cybersecurity. I would like to, uh, I think I uh, finished uh, the presentation. I'd like to uh, stop uh, uh, here. And uh, I'd like to give the word to Jan uh, to see if there are questions uh, in the chat. Thank you very much uh, for your very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, we will take some uh, uh, questions from the chat, uh, but if enough time is left, uh, we will uh, try to do an interactive uh, questioning Q and answer uh, with the Mentimeter. Uh, so go to then to menti.com and select the drive and give the code eight. 6674500. We have already, uh, it's also in the chat uh, mentioned the, the code. Um, so uh, I have some questions from the, from the chat. Um, uh, Alex Boussenkol uh, asks, what about the pri privacy uh, of the systems? Okay, maybe uh, one, uh, maybe it could be more specific. Pri privacy of what systems and uh, what would be the exact question? Yeah, well, we we must ask Alex to give a uh, more specification. Then we go to the to the uh, next one. Oh, um, with all the connections uh, to your houses for uh, the private uh, energy. Um, generation. You are in fact watching into my house what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So there is a privacy concern about that. Exactly. So I, I think we this uh, is taken into account by the GDPR regulations. Um, there's also a big impact of this uh, the, of your valid concerns on smart metering, and that's why smart metering data there's not there's no um, it's the, the use of smart metering data is strictly regulated, and there are also um, there are also uh, mechanisms in place, and um, uh, we have re at UDelft and worldwide researchers conduct uh, they, they they investigate how to use. Uh, how to preserve privacy, but also extract useful information to help uh, system operations. So I, I fully resonate with you. Privacy is critical. Uh, you don't want, uh, based on spam metering data, to know when people are on holidays or not at home. Uh, but at the same time, the GDPR, uh, I think, uh, are addressing these issues and grid operators would need uh, to um, would need to um, uh, to to uh, to enforce the GDPR uh, rules. Is this answering your question? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Um, uh, I have another question from Paul. Yes, it is. Uh, is the bus system fast enough to replace the hardwired system? Uh, can you repeat that? So is what uh, is, the, fast is the bus system? Okay. Uh, you, you mentioned the, the bus systems in the in the substations. Is that fast enough to replace the hardwired system which was uh, installed before? Uh, my personal opinion is yes. I think I think so. Uh, uh, it's it's very fast, and that's why uh, digital substations and IC62850 uh, standard are very popular, and it, the popularity of it actually increases uh, uh, exponentially. Uh, we, um, I think it offers uh, not only the speed, but also um, uh, more flexibility uh, uh, in controlling the assets and monitoring them. Okay, that 
uh, I hope the, the question is answered by this. Um, a question of Walter Bouvy, my son. Isn't it possible to air gap the systems? Well, uh, air gapping. Uh, yeah, this is very interesting and good question. So air, uh, we try to um, for the transmission and distribution system operators, um, we keep the communication networks uh, for uh, the uh, let's say for the business operation separate from the communication networks used for the control room for the substations uh, for monitoring and controlling the power grid. But air gap would mean to have a complete uh, separation between them and there are legitimate uh, uh, reasons uh, to have data communicated from the uh, operations uh, uh, world to business to support the manage uh, the, the business operations. So think of energy markets. You need real time data from the power grid. So having a complete air gap, I'm afraid these days is uh, not possible uh, or uh, uh, extremely difficult to do. Uh, but we have uh, means in place. So we have. Um, uh, firewalls that would um, uh, uh, separate, segregate the operation technologies with from the IT systems. We also have new uh, technologies called data diodes. So a data diode uh, would break a lot of communications because uh, it only ensures data to communicate from in one direction from the operation technology to the IT system. And this is the closest technology I think that we have to uh, a complete air gapping. Um, so that's why I mentioned it's more and more difficult to keep the private communication networks of utilities completely separate from the public communication networks. And one final example uh, is that um, the vendors who provide uh, cooperation, op the operational technologies, the, 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 uh, the technology for uh, monitoring and controlling the substations and so on, they, uh, they need remote communications to uh, update for patching, for updating the software. Uh, it, uh, they, uh, so this is can only be done if you integrate. So uh, I'm afraid a complete air gap uh, is very difficult. OK, I hope the question is answered by this. Uh, a, last, a last question or a remark from Ingrid Guillaume. The voting menti is closed. Uh, I see the same at my uh, uh, iPhone. OK. Um, so it's not working. Oh, oh, you have okay. to. I have to uh, press the C. OK, uh, I did that. So um, so we can go to the menti. Uh, yes. Yeah, so well, in this um, uh, scenario, I repeat again the, the smart grid uh, image and uh, the questions. Can you identify cyber threats in a smart grid? So um, of, uh, to give you an example, uh, like a threat would be uh, somebody uh, attackers like we've seen in 2015. They can take uh, control of the control room uh, and uh, disconnect all power plants or transmission lines, and that would cause a blackout. So that's a threat. What other what other threats uh, or cyber threats you could uh, identify? And uh, it will be just a nice discussion to, to see what you think and what you've learned from this webinar. I think we have one uh, answer. Uh, yes, A with AI, for example. OK. Monitoring and uh, malware protecting software uh, to the digital connecting networks in replacing the hardware connections. Physical separation of operation and security system. Denial of service of that valid comments. Do not reach actuators and control is lost. Yeah, very good. While we wait for more comments, I think the first answer with AI, for example, it's a bit um, uh, uh, vague, so maybe uh, you could um, let us know what do you mean exactly? So how we AI is used for system operations and maybe you can submit another text or just unmute and uh, we can engage in the discussion.
So you have to analyze the cyber attack software. Um, not sure if I understand this question. Uh, it's my uh, yeah. It's my question. Okay. Um, uh, for you have the cyber attacks uh, on on the on the systems, um, and you mentioned uh, several um, uh, uh, cyber attacks software uh, methods in the in the uh, one of the sheets you had mm -hmm. uh, with uh, with the years and where it happened. Yep. Do you have to to analyze the the software behind it, or you s just say for oh that that power line is out? Um, so you mean software by uh, how we we run the power system the, for the impact for the power system yes, simulation? Yes. Yeah, so uh, we use uh, the the uh, in this case uh, the software provided by RTDS to uh, analyze the impact on how the power system stability would be impacted, and uh, so I would say yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. My solar panels communicate with the web service uh, in China. Well. Um, I, we can generalize this. Uh, uh, so with, uh, you it's mean like question, solar yeah. panels communicate with a web service in a country that uh, uh, is not maybe in Europe and does not have to obey the rules and regulations of European Union. So yes, that would be, uh, I would say, a concern. It's also could be a concern like uh, when we store data. Uh, the also data, it's it, when you have a web server or you, you want to store your data in the cloud, uh, it, it's good to have it uh, that uh, cloud located physically in Europe um, uh, so that they uh, implement the rules and regulations of European Union. Um, but here you mean also, uh, you may mean that if somebody can, uh, if, if the solar panels communicate with the web service uh, in a remote, in, a, in another country, that means they could uh, monitor and con uh, what you what uh, your consumption or in this case solar panels the generation um, and even I would say even going one step further if the firmware or the technology is provided by a vendor in one of these countries they could also uh, perhaps introduce a backdoor uh, in the smart inverters to take also control so not only monitor your uh, let's say energy generation from the so pal solar panels, but also could uh, take control of the smart metering. And this is also, I would say, related with uh, the previous uh, example where EV charging uh, could be um, also hacked. Yeah, right? and perhaps that uh, if, if uh, very many solar panels are switched off, that you can get disturbances in your network, in your grid. Exactly, on, on the distribution network, it will definitely have an impact. Um, it could would have, an I, I think, an impact on the voltage stability. Yeah. So uh, may, may even cause uh, a power outage depending on the, uh, let's say, the uh, robustness of the distribution network and also of the aggregated volume of load uh, that is being um, uh, being targeted. But I, I, uh, I think uh, that's uh, a threat, yeah. Yeah, well, we come to the end of, uh, of this uh, webinar. Um, thank you for your time and your knowledge for today's webinar. We will pre uh, present you an uh, appreciation, uh, our appreciation by a digital present, which will be sent to you shortly. Uh, our next webinar will be at the 18th of January, 2023 about the application of iron powder in the energy transition for use, storage and transport by Conrad Hessels of the Technical University of Eindhoven. This was my last lunch webinar. Be sure there will be lots of next uh, year. Uh, enjoy your day and hopefully see you again at our next webinars. Uh, please play, stay stay a little on, uh, Alex. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jan. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining us today.